when you are looking at the assessment of mitosmosis, we are looking at the involvement of the of, of the mitral valve by various etiologies of which rheumatic heart disease in this part of the world is very common or it, it is the most common etiology. Of course, you've got other etiologies like congenital mitrostenosis and you've got drug-induced this this valvulopathies, and you got calcific mitostenosis. But the most common cause in this part of the world is rheumatic heart disease, and the mitral valve is the most common valve which is involved in mitostenosis. Uh, is the most common valve that is involved in rheumatic heart disease. So when we talk about the etiology I've already got told you, amongst this uh, etiology for this congenital MS, we got the most common cause of the congenital MS is the parachute mitral valve, but we've got other types of involvement like the arcade variety of this mitral stenosis in which the subvalve apparatus is severely deranged. Then you've got double orifice mitral valve and a supravalvular mitral ring, which are the less common etiologies. Then you've got drug-induced valvulopathy, connective tissue disease. And of course, sometimes the mitral valve could be involved in amyloid disease. And as a differential diagnosis, we can sometimes look at the tumors in the LA, like an LA myxoma, which can this, this masquerade as mitral stenosis. So if you look at drug-induced valvulopathies, since uh, many of you will not be you know, uh, knowing too much about it, so let just let me go through it. So you have the anorexogens, which were used in the treatment of, of obesity many years ago. Amongst them was the fenfluramine and x fenfluramine which were appetite suppressants. Then you had the dopamine agonists. You had the pergolide and carbogolene, which are used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease and hyperprolactinemia. You had the ergot alkaloids, like the methysergide and ergotamine, which are used for migraine treatment and prophylaxis. And then the recreational drugs like uh, three, four, this methylene dioxine methamphetamine, which is called ecstasy. So these are some of the drugs, as I've already told you. The most common valve involved in the drug induced valvulopathy is the tricuspid valve, but then the mitral valve is also involved. And basically, on echo echocardiography, the this morphology looks like rheumatic mitostenosis. But the important thing is, as you discontinue the drug, then over the next few months, the valve morphology becomes normal. So basically, when we have to assess mitosmosis, of course, we make a clinical assessment by uh, examination of the CVS. So simply what we do at that time is to look for the, this, this mid-diastolic murmur for mitosmosis. We also look for the complications of this mitral stenosis, which can be atrial fibrillation as the left atrial, as, as the left atrium gets enlarged and over a period of time, it 
the shoulders are disorganized rhythm and you get atrial fibrillation. So you get irregular pulse. And then you can have involvement of other valves and the mitral valve could also leak. We call it mitral regurgitation along with mitral stimulus. There are certain other diseases uh, of the heart which can be associated with mitral stenosis, and amongst them is atrial septal defect. And since atrial septal defect is a very common congenital heart disease, and mitral stenosis is also a very common acquired heart disease, then you know they can just coincidentally be associated with each other. And this involvement is called the luton backers syndrome, in which the symptoms and signs of mitosmosis clinically are suppressed, while the symptoms and signs of atrial septal defect, that is the left to right shunt across the atrial septum, are exaggerated. So when we want to assess mitral stenosis by echocardiogram, echocardiogram nowadays is the gold standard for the assessment of mitral stenosis. And this echocardiogram initially about 40, 50 years ago, there was M mode echo only. And there were certain features on the M mode echo, which you could diagnose mitral stenosis. But now, more, more commonly, we are using 2D echo and sometimes 3D echo for the assessment of mitral stenosis. And what we do also is to assess the severity of mitral stenosis by taking the pressure gradients, that is the pressure difference across the mitral orifice using the continuous wave Doppler, then you can get the gradients and you can also planimeter the mitral orifice on 2D echo and 3D echo. By Doppler, we can use the pressure half time and the continuity equation. And by color Doppler, occasionally we can use the PISA method though not very common. And occasionally we can use the substituted Collins equation. But the most common method that we use is 2D planimetry and 3D planimetry, the continuity equation and the pressure half time. So this is the natural orifice area by planimetry. You can see that on the parasternal short axis view at the level of the mitral orifice, you got the anterior mitral leaflet, the posterior mitral leaflet, and you got the medial commissure, the posteromedial commissure, and the anterolateral commissure. And you got the orifice in between. And you can, you, you can planimeter this orifice at the, its maximum size, usually in mid sleep. So this you can see is a tight mitral stenosis with a mitral valve area of 0.7 centimeters squared. And you can see the thickened mitral valve on the echocardiogram by arrows. They indicate the mitral orifice. You've got the left atrium, which is enlarged. You've got the left atrium. You've got the, the, the normal size LV. And you've got the right ventricle, which is enlarged due to the development of pulmonary hypertension. And this is a combination of mitral stenosis with aortic regurgitation. So the two most common valves involved in rheumatic heart disease are the mitral valve and the aortic valve. So if you look at the criteria for the severity of MS by echocardiography, so we look at the gradients and the valve area, so if you take mild mitral stenosis, the mean pressure gradient is less than five millimeters of mercury, and the mitral valve area is more than 1.5 centimeters squared. Then we call it a mild mitral stenosis.
if the mean pressure gradient is between 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury and the mitral valve area is 1 to 1.5 centimeters squared, it is called the moderate mitral stenosis. And the mean pressure gradient is more than 10 millimeters of mercury, then we call it severe mitral stenosis and the valve area is less than 1 centimeter squared. Having said this, it is important to note that the American Society of Echocardiography defines a severe mitral stenosis as a mitral valve area less than 1.5 centimeters squared and a very severe mitral stenosis as a mitral valve area less than 1 centimeter squared. But in India, we've got much more experience in mitral stenosis than, than in the Western world. And therefore, we go by this criteria that I've just mentioned. And of course, to validate whether the Doppler is accurate, many years ago, this study was done, which was a simultaneous Doppler catheterization study. And in that, you could get the mean pressure gradient, which is in red over here, between the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, that is the left atrial pressure, which is there in green. That green line that you're seeing is the line for the left atrial pressure. And the orange line in diastole is for the left ventricular pressure. So the left atrial pressure being higher than left, left ventricle pressure, the mean pressure gradient being 8 millimeters of mercury. And by Doppler, you get a gradient of 7 millimeters of mercury. So almost, you can say, a one-to-one -one correlation between the mitral valve gradients by echocardiography and using cardiac catheterization. So now we do not do cardiac catheterization for the diagnosis of mitral stenosis unless the echo window is very poor. So nowadays we get all the information about mitral stenosis and its complications by echocardiography. The most important thing also when you're doing echo, besides looking at the mitral orifice area and the pressure gradients, we are looking at the left atrial size and the normal left atrial size is usually less than 35 millimeters of mercury. A borderline elevated is 35 to 40. 40 to 45 is a mildly elevated left atrial size. And more than 50 millimeters is a markedly elevated LA size. Then in patients, we have to look at the left atrial appendage. And echocardiography is a good technique for the left atrial appendage to look for the lodgement of any LA clots, which can embolize and especially can embolize to the arteries of the brain and cause hemiplegia. So if we always look for left atrial clots, we identify the left atrial appendage and we look for the presence of LA clot, especially when there is atrial fibrillation. So this is, you can see on my right side, you have got the M mode echo showing mitral stenosis. The posterior mitral leaflet is the tether to the anterior mitral leaflet and moves along with it anteriorly. And those two plus signs indicate the distance between the two leaflets, which approximately can give you some idea about the mitral valve area. But the mitral valve area has got a 2D echo and 3D echo. 3D echo correlates better with cardiac catheterization than 2D echo, but 2D echo by itself is highly accurate. So this you can see the mitral valve area we are plenimeter on 2D echo, 1.63 centimeters squared, which is mild mitral stenosis. Now you can see the moving clips of a patient with mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation. You can see that the anterior mitral leaflet has a hockey stick appearance because of the commissural fusion. 
So the tips of the mitral valve are fused, while the base, it domes, it shows diastolic doming, so which is very typical of mitral stenosis, especially with the pliable mitral valve. And, you, and on, on, on the right hand screen, you're getting the mitral revegetation as blue color inside the left atrium during systolic phase. Another patient with M word echo and 2D echo showing mitral stenosis, and you're getting the difference. I mean, the distance between the anterior mitral leaflet, posterior mitral leaflet of almost one centimeter. So it's, it's, it's at least a moderate mitral stenosis on M mode echo. And you've got the EF slope, which is showing on the right hand panel and which is uh, markedly re 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 reduced as 2.08 centimeters per second. Another patient, now you got the Doppler here on, on the left-hand panel, a continuous red Doppler. You got a peak pressure gradient as it is in, in, indicated as maximum P, maximum PG as 19 and mean PG as eight, which is a fairly tight mitral And you got a mitral valve area by planimetry of 0 0.9 centimeter squared. So this is a tight mitral stenosis. So another pictures of rheumatic heart disease with tight mitral stenosis and some degree of aortic regurgitation. You see in some degree of mitral regurgitation also. But this is a tight mitral stenosis. And the planimeter mitral valve area was 0 0.49 centimeters squared, indicating a tight mitral stenosis. Now this is a milder MS, and you can see both on 2D echo on the left hand side and a 3D echo picture is seen on the right hand side for planimetry of mitral stenosis. Now this is an apical four chamber view. On, on, on the left hand panel, you're getting a 2D echo. Now on the right hand panel, a 3D echo. And this is a case of, mod, of a moderate mitral stenosis with a moderate calcification, those bright echoes that you see on the LV side of the mitral valve, those bright shiny echoes, they are actually calcified mitral valve and the calcified body that you're getting. So, the man, so over a period of time, the mitral valve gets calcified and is no longer very pliable. And therefore, the treatment becomes somewhat difficult using uh, what we do normally is a balloon mitral valvuloplasty. Previously, we used to do a closed heart surgery, which was called a closed mitral valvulotomy, valvulotomy or CMV, which has been given up since 1990 or 1995, maybe. The last of the CMVs were done by the cardiac surgeons, but now the cardiologists perform BMV. And as we'll be, as we'll be showing further, there are certain criteria for uh, taking up a patient with good mitral stenosis for uh, BMV, that is balloon mitral valvuloplasty. Again, a patient on the left-hand panel, a 3D echo, showing a planimetral mitral valve area of 1.1, a mean pressure gradient of 7, valve area by pressure half time is 1.5. So you can see sometimes there could be a discrepancy between the pressure half time and planimetry, but we go by planimetry as the most common 
as the most accurate method. And so we're getting a moderate mitral stenosis on planimetry. This is another patient with a tight mitral stenosis, a long axis view along with aortic regurgitation, mild aortic regurgitation, a mild mitral regurgitation. And you got a, a 3D echo on the right hand panel. A 3D echo by planimetry of 0.87. Now, the 3D echo planimetry, because you know where to take it just at the tips, so you are able to get a 3D echo, uh, this image of the mitral orifice at the tips because you want it there and you can get it right at the tips and not at the doming region. And you can get a more accurate uh, the value of the mitral orifice area than by a 2D echo. But then 2D echo is also very accurate. So even if you do not have the facility and you do not have the expertise and experience with 3D echo, then it is all right even if you use the 2D echo for assessment as long as you are expert with 2D echo. Because in planimetry on 2D, it's very important that you get it at the tips of the mitral orifice. And that requires some experience. And you have to be accurate taking the mitral orifice in mid diastole and then planimetering it on 2D echo. It requires experience and expertise. But then if you're doing 2D echo and you're making a diagnosis, then that expertise should be there in the person who is doing it. Now, this is that when you are taking the planimetry of the mitral valve that is there on the 3D echo on the right-hand panel, and then you are looking at the gradients by continuous for Doppler. Now, if you see very closely the picture on my left-hand column, the Doppler is showing a very high gradient of 4.5 meters per second. That is a gradient of almost 80 millimeters of mercury, which is not usually seen in microstenosis. And in this case, it is due to the fact that you got aortic regurgitation, which is also there in diastole, while the microstenosis is also a diastolic event. And what you get over here is actually the gradient of AR and not a gradient of MS. And that sometimes can happen when you are trying to get the best possible gradients across the mitral valve. So you have to be careful about that, that you're not interrogating aortic regurgitation.